I want to introduce you to a friend of mine, uh, Rick Sharga, Executive Vice President of 10X. Uh, 10X is the parent company of Auction.com. That's probably the brand that you're more aware of. Uh, everything really from multifamily to single family to commercial, 10X and Auction.com does. Uh, but that's not really the basis of the conversation tonight. Uh, one of the things I've enjoyed about listening to Rick talk, uh, I've never actually heard him speak in Dallas. Typically, it's at a conference somewhere. Uh, he, he really understands the underlying factors that influence the housing market. And if you want to be an astute investor and you want to grow your business and you want to be able to sustain market cycles like George and I have uh, through the peaks and the valleys, you really have to understand what influences the housing market and what makes buying patterns emerge and really be two, three steps ahead of or do, when do we become a renter nation versus when does household household formation come back and when household formation comes back how does that in uh, impact the home ownership rate and all of these things and so a presentation like this is one of those things we want to bring to you and, and, and let you really think outside the box of just I want to find a house at 70 LTV right we want to let a presentation like this help you influence not only your personal buying strategy, but if you're in the service business, a realtor or a advisor, help you help your customers better. So uh, I'd like to introduce you to my friend, Rick Sharga, uh, Executive Vice President of 10X. Yes, sir. Good evening. Do that sound check one more time. Yeah, we're, we're uh, we don't need the whole voice of God thing. It's okay, there we go. Thank you for uh, sticking around tonight. Thank you for bringing this uh, very hospitable Dallas heat for me. I really do appreciate that. Yeah. I'm glad I didn't wear a heavy wool suit. That would have been really, really bad news. But uh, I'm gonna stay down here rather than get up on the podium because it feels kind of pretentious being up there by myself. I'd rather be down here with y'all. And uh, uh, as, as Tim said, uh, my name is Rick Sharga. I'm an executive vice president for 10X. Um, we're gonna cover Pardon me? 10X? My name. Uh, I'll actually have all my contact information up at the, at the end, but my last name is spelled S-H-A-R-G-A. -A. Uh, first name is Rick, R-I-C-K. If you're here with the IRS, <laughs> it's spelled S-M-I-T-H, and my first name is Xavier. Um, <laughs> We're gonna cover a lot tonight, and I'm, I, I'm gonna apologize in advance for going through a lot of this pretty quickly. I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the U.S. housing market, and spend a little bit of time talking about the Dallas market, just some kind of top line trend information that, that our research team uh, has been looking at, especially when it comes to home ownership and renting. Tell you a little bit about 10X, Play a little bit more toward the end about auction.com, which might be a site that some of you have used. Anybody here used auction.com before? Oh, most of you, a lot, not most of you, but a lot of you. Um, and then we'll, we'll open it up for, uh, for, for questions if anybody has anything when we're done with this. So quickly, who is 10X and, and where did that name come from? And oh my goodness. So we are, we are the leading online real estate marketplace. We were founded in 2007. We got into the commercial business in 2009. I see some of you taking pictures. If you would like a copy of these slides when I'm done, please see me, give me a business card and I'll be happy to email them to you. Uh, but, but that way you don't have to spend a whole lot of time snapping photos because I know you're not snapping photos of me. That would just be a waste of, of digits. Um, we got into commercial real estate in 2009 and we rebranded this year as, as 10X. Uh, we did that for a couple reasons I can get into. Uh, since we started, we've sold over 200,000 properties. Uh, we started as auction.com. Uh, we sold over $39 billion of residential and commercial assets, uh, mostly to people like you, uh, although some, some of that goes to institutional buyers as well. Um, we have some investors that you might have heard of, companies like Starwood, uh, Stone Point Capital, who's been with us since the beginning, and most recently, Google Capital came in as an investor about a year and a half ago. Uh, tremendous, tremendous partner. Um, it, forget about the money for a minute. Uh, what was really useful about Google is, is the 
the access they've given us to people inside their company. So we've been working with their engineering team on redoing our mobile products, our web products. We've been working with their marketing folks on getting better at search engine marketing. Turns out Google's actually pretty good at search engine marketing. Who knew? Um, and, and I've actually had a chance to meet with their chief economist to talk about some of their forecasting models. I didn't even know Google had a chief economist until, until we got to meet with them. Um, the 10X family of companies, and this is, I think, the last 10X slide, we have three business units now. We have Auction.com, which is our legacy business, and it is exclusively focused on selling bank-owned properties and foreclosure properties. And if you know Mr. Roddy, you know there's a difference between foreclosures and bank-owned properties. Um, and we, we focus on selling those to investors. These are all residential properties. Some of them might be multifamily, but, but it's small multifamily, so it's mostly residential. We also have a, a, a business called 10X Commercial. You're all pretty smart, so I'm guessing you know that that's a commercial website. We sell, we sell properties uh, to commercial investors. Uh, and then our startup business is a little thing called 10X Homes. It's our first attempt at true consumer marketing, and we are trying to market move-in ready single family homes to traditional home buyers. In many cases, they're working with realtors using traditional financing. Uh, the reason we changed the name to 10X is, is twofold. One, uh, our consumer research uh, and consumers in both the residential and commercial space showed us that everybody associated the word auction with distressed properties they could buy at a discount. If you're a home seller, or if you're trying to sell a $100 million commercial building, you don't want your property on a discount site. So that was gonna become a problem. We've also spent the last year developing our first transaction products that let you buy a property online without actually using an auction. So for the first time, you can basically take that offline process that you're used to, and you now move it online so you can do that process anywhere you happen to be, uh, anytime you want on any computing device you'd like. So it's about bringing the efficiency of the internet to a very inefficient process. But because of that, we wanted a name that was short, was easy to remember, sounded a little techy. Uh, it's turned out to become a rallying cry internally. I, that, I, wish I'd, I wish we were smart enough to have thought of that in advance, but we actually had people walking around the hall saying things like, come on, we're trying to make real estate 10 times better for everybody. And we're like, oh, this works, it's good. Um, so that, that's the 10X story. I can tell you a little bit more about auction.com as we get to the end. I think for, for what most of you are probably doing, auction.com is a site to focus on. But I want you to remember 10X homes uh, because, because as we, we talked a little bit about buying and selling real estate, there, there's some, some implications for you as we move forward. So what's going on in housing? Um, the good news is we stopped falling back here in about 2009, 2010. Uh, so there actually was a place before the end of the world where the housing market was, was finally going to stop. Um, we are nowhere near back to normal. This is, uh, a lot of people have, have kind of lost sight of the fact that we've gone through the most volatile boom and bust cycle probably in the history of the U.S. housing market. Uh, and I don't say that lightly because my parents and my grandparents were, were alive during the Great Depression, which most people really look at as, as, as one of the worst periods in U.S. housing. But think about what happened when the housing market crashed back in 2008, 2009, 2010. We, had over set, we were selling over 7 million existing homes a year. We were selling over 1.2 million new homes a year. 8.5 million homes being transacted a year. We were at over 70% home ownership rates at a time when we had 330 million people living in the country. Uh, and at precisely that moment, the whole house of cards crumbled. Uh, in a normal year, about 1% of homes go into foreclosure. Uh, and about 4% of homes are, are delinquent on their loans, but not yet in foreclosure. So roughly 5% of the loans in the marketplace, God bless you, are, are in distress. At the peak of the foreclosure crisis, that number was about 15%. About 4% of homes, four times the normal number were in foreclosure. Uh, about 11%, uh, two and a half times the normal rate were, were delinquent. And that 15% number hit at precisely the time when we had more people ho owning homes than ever before in history. So the numbers are just frightening. Um, we fell pretty far. According to the Case-Shiller numbers, uh, home, homes lost value to the tune of about 35% on average across the country. Certain markets got hammered much, much worse than that. Uh, Central Valley of California, Las Vegas, Arizona, Florida, 
you were seeing prices drop 50, 60 percent. So if it feels like it's taken forever for us to dig out of that hole, it's because it's taken us forever to dig out of that hole. It was a really, really deep hole. What's been interesting about this recovery is we're, we're now back up to about 5 million, 5.3 million existing home sales nationally as of this year. We'll probably be between 550 and 600,000 new home sales. That still leaves us about a million homes shy of what we would normally be selling given our population and some of the other demographics that, that are, are, are what we're seeing in the United States. Um, but while we're still slow in terms of, of home sales, home prices on average have actually surpassed the peak prices. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what's driving prices in a minute. But what you can see here obviously is the, the lighter blue line there is, is existing home sales. Uh, the darker purple line is, is new home sales. Uh, existing home sales are, are going up and down, but if you, if you smooth out that line, it's almost flat. We sold about 5.1 million homes last year. We'll sell about 5.3 to 5.4 million this year. We'll probably sell about 5.5 to 5.6 million next year. Um, we will not be back to a full recovery, which would be somewhere north of 6 million homes uh, until probably somewhere late in 2018. It's a very regional recovery as well. Uh, I mentioned Florida really got clobbered during the downturn. Florida is red hot right now, uh, almost as hot as it is here in Dallas and much more humid. Um, <laughs> But, but if, if you look at this eye chart underneath the, uh, the, the chart on top, we just released a report on the hottest housing markets for the summer. Uh, four of the top five are from Florida. So the market is coming back with a vengeance. If you're looking for somewhere out of state, that's not a bad place to look. And one of the things we noticed about that is, even with that dramatic increase in sales, home prices there are still at about 50% of where they were at peak. Uh, Texas, interestingly enough, uh, across the state, never really fell as far as most other parts of the country. That's because your lending practices here were a little more strict when all the nonsense started, so you didn't have people, as many people, getting loans they couldn't afford as crazy places like California. Um, but your prices are way beyond peak in a lot of markets. Austin in particular is just ridiculously expensive right now. Um, the other part of the country that's on fire is the Pacific Northwest. And you wouldn't expect that because of all the rain. But, but, but Portland, Seattle, year over year, the numbers are just goofy. Seattle uh, has less than a month's worth of available inventory for sale and virtually nothing in the, in the city itself. So th we're seeing, and what's driving it, honestly, it is a good thing. And, and this, is, this is, if you take nothing else away from tonight, I will tell you that the real good news about the housing market, wherever we are in the process of recovery, is that it's, it's gone back to fundamentals. So for 100 years, what drove housing was pretty predictable. You'd have increase in jobs, which would be able to translate into the number of, of households being formed. And from the number of households being formed, you could predict how many, how many home purchases there would be. And then funny stuff happened back around 2003 to 2008, and none of the rules applied anymore. That was one of the problems people had trying to predict foreclosure activity. Because typically what you would see is unemployment numbers spike and foreclosure numbers spiked. When foreclosure numbers spiked back in 2010, we had some of the highest employment rates in the history of the country. So it wasn't driven by normal predictors. What we're seeing now in the really hot markets is job growth and population growth. And those are two things you can typically predict. What's screwing things up a little bit is inventory. We'll talk about that in a minute. But all these green areas are, are reasonably hot. The greener, the hotter. The, the, the pink and the red are, are markets that aren't terribly strong right now. The white ones are kind of neutral. Uh, but what we are seeing is that the, the west, the southwest, the south, uh, very, very strong by and large. There are some pockets that aren't as strong as others. Uh, the midwest and the northeast, not so much. Uh, not surprisingly, the only areas of the country where we're still seeing a lot of foreclosure activity are the Midwest and the Northeast. And that's not because they have a lot of new loans that are going bad, it's because they have such remarkably long foreclosure processes. In New York, it can take over 1,200 days to execute a foreclosure. So what you're seeing when you read about foreclosure numbers popping up in some markets, these are loans that are really old loans that are finally working their way through the process that probably should have been foreclosed on two or three or maybe four years ago. 
In a lot of cases, those borrowers haven't made a single payment in three, four, or five years. Uh, so so it's, it's working its way through the system, and I, I suspect that by, by next year at this time, they'll almost be all worked out. So we, we, I mentioned inventory is the, 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 the culprit in a lot of things. So one of the things you have, to, you have to give inventory credit or blame for is how quickly home prices are rising. One of the reasons that home prices are rising is because in markets where people want to live, there are very few homes going on the market and people bid up against each other. That's why in a market like San Francisco, the median home price is $1.1 million. San Francisco, so don't move there. Um, plus, you all look like fairly normal people. San Francisco, okay. Um, I just spent all last week there. It's, it's a beautiful city, but it's quite an experience. Um, but for 1.1 million, you're not getting a big house in San Francisco. You're, you're getting a 1,500 square foot, three bedroom, one bath, probably fixer upper. So it's completely insane, but all the technology money's moving in there. So people ask, is there a bubble? No, there really isn't a bubble, even with these prices going up. The people that are buying these properties can afford to buy the properties. What inflated the bubble last time was lenders were giving loans to people who could not afford what they were buying. Then when the market went a little bit soft, everything blew up. But it's still almost twice as hard to get a loan today for the average borrower than it was before the boom and bust cycle. So the last time we were in a normal market, it was only half as difficult for the average borrower to get a loan. One of the things that the Com Consumer Finance Protection Bureau has done, uh, the CFPB, when they tried to put new rules in place for, for lending, is they accidentally made it almost impossible for anybody who's not right squarely in the middle of that perfect borrower profile to get a loan. In fact, just their ability to repay rules, which dictate that you can't have any more than a 43% debt to income ratio. So your debts can't account for any more than 43% of your monthly income. Uh, that eliminated 38% of African American and Hispanic borrowers from the mix. Just that one move. So if, you, if you're not a really, really good borrower right now, you're gonna have an almost impossible time getting a loan. In fact, almost all of the loans, all the conventional loans, 96% of loans today are underwritten by the government. Fannie, Freddie, FHA, uh, VA, USDA, Ginnie Mae, uh, all the Mays uh, are, are underwriting about 96% of the loans. The only exceptions uh, are jumbo loans that are written to high net worth individuals. Uh, the banks are writing those because they want those individuals as customers for other services. So you're seeing jumbo loans, but those are the only exceptions. Uh, the non-bank lenders, companies like Quicken, some smaller companies are coming into the market. They might provide a little bit more latitude. Um, we'll, we'll see how all that works. But, but inventory's been driving up prices. Not enough properties equals bidding wars equals higher prices. Uh, it's supply and demand, ec economics 101. Um, in a normal market, we'd have about six to six and a half months available inventory for, for purchase. Right now, we're looking at about 4.2 to 4.4 months. And again, in some of the hotter markets, it, it's much lower than that. Uh, and and uh, it, it really is regional. If you're, if you're on the coasts, if you're in Texas, if you're in a couple other states, inventory is precious. Prices are, are escalating pretty rapidly. If you're in St. Louis and New Orleans and Baltimore, not so much. People are still trying to get rid of properties there. Yes? Would you please touch somewhere on the conversation about luxury homes in Quantico, Frisco, Dallas, over 750? No. But it's a great question. So would I touch on some of the luxury homes of places like, well, like So uh, here's why I won't, because I hate to answer a question if I really don't know anything about the subject. And I have not done research on the luxury market in your area. So I'd rather tell you, if you're interested, I can maybe look it up afterwards. But I, I, I don't like to comment on stuff I'm making statistics up about. Uh, I will tell you that by and large, uh, what we're seeing nationally, this may apply here, may not, uh, is that luxury home sales are not moving at as robust a pace as the mid-market. Part of the reason for that is those prices didn't adjust as much during the downturn as the middle market did and as the lower part of the market did. If you look at foreclosures, and we'll talk about them in a minute, uh, a disproportionately high percentage of homes in foreclosure are actually at the, the entry level part of the market, the low end of the market. 
Um, but luxury homes, for a variety of reasons, weren't foreclosed on as rapidly. Uh, you didn't have the, the prices trending down. Um, so they don't represent quite as good a bargain. So where I live in Orange County, California, if you price a property anywhere between $300,000 and $750,000, depending on the size of the house and the exact location, it's off the market in a couple weeks. Uh, if you go eight hundred dollars and up, they sit. So it, it's, that's what I, I, I've seen that sort of scenario play out in, in multiple markets across the country. I'm not sure what's going on with yours. Uh, the new home market, which could solve a lot of the inventory problems, uh, is, is starting to, to kind of work its way back up. But, but look, look at this at the peak of the market and look where we went at the bottom of the market. And if, if you kind of go back as long as they've been keeping new home inventory numbers back into the 70s, 40 years ago, that was the lowest number of new home inventory ever. Ever. Not on a percentage basis, lowest number ever. So the builders overbuilt, then they ran into a whole bunch of problems ranging from capital, because nobody wanted to lend them money to build properties they couldn't sell. There was a, a small development in California, had about 170 houses that got bulldozed because the bank couldn't find anybody to buy anything. Uh, and that, by the way, wasn't just California, that happened in a lot of places around the country. Uh, a lot of the labor force left. Um, supply chain got, got squished a little bit. So, so the builders right now are typically only building things in the mid-market and up. They're typically only building if they have a buyer in hand when they start the project. Uh, permitting has gotten more difficult and more, more time consuming. Um, so we're, we're seeing, the good news is this blue area, which is really the one you want to keep your eye on, the, the red stuff is completed, okay? So that's, that's what's available to be sold today. Blue means they're actually building. So that's coming to market. That's a good sign. Uh, the green stuff is, is basically permits. It's not started. And that number is a little bit problematic right now. Uh, so we're not seeing a lot of permitting activity or as much as we'd like. And there's no new home inventory available nationally for entry level buyers. So when you see month to month that there aren't a lot of first time home buyers, it's for two reasons. One, they can't buy anything new. And two, most of the stuff they would like to buy that's existing homes, uh, hasn't been put on the market by the existing home owners because a lot of them are still underwater on their purchase. Uh, and that number has gone down significantly over the last few years. At the peak, I think something like 30% of, of mortgages were actually underwater. Uh, now the number is down below percent, depending on whose numbers you believe. But let's say it is 10% of home buyers or home, home borrowers. That means you still have five and a half million borrowers who are underwater on their loans. Uh, and as prices go up, that gets fixed but doesn't get fixed as fast as people need. And, and so uh, there's, there's a huge number, probably twice that many of, of homeowners who are not underwater anymore, but don't have enough equity that they can afford to sell that house and buy another one. So effectively, you're talking about 15 million homes or so that might be coming to market, but aren't coming to market because the, the, the borrower can't afford to sell it. So those are the two things that are keeping inventory numbers down. Housing starts are getting better. Um, uh, we, we are starting to see something that's, that's approaching. I, I would say on average, you'd probably be somewhere around here, around 1.3 million. You're probably down here a little over one. So, so it's trending in the right direction. And for the first time in a while, uh, what we are seeing is that the single family numbers, which are the, the light blue line at the bottom, compared to the overall numbers, or the multifamily numbers rather, are starting to make up a higher percentage of, of the housing starts. So for the last few years, when you hear about housing starts being good, and that's your first step toward more inventory, toward more sales, uh, what that number what was not telling you is that it was inflated by the amount of multifamily. So the builders anticipated more renters than buyers and were building more multifamily units over the last few years. We're finally starting to see the single family numbers come up. And this is regional too, so I, I don't have that broken out for you, but. But keep in mind where you're seeing population grow, where you're seeing demographics improve, where you're seeing jobs moving, that's where you're seeing a lot of building. I'm meeting with a builder in, in Fort Worth tomorrow, in fact, uh, before I fly back to the coast because he's looking for, for ways to, to sell some of his new inventory. So we are, we are starting to see some of that happen. <clears throat> we talked about prices. The one thing I, so we had double digit price growth for, for a few years coming out of the, the bust. 
Uh, people were a little bit concerned about that, but really we fell so far that it was just the market correcting a little faster than anybody expected. If you were to average this out, this price thing, and you go back a little bit further uh, and, and just straight line the whole thing, what you would see is that our prices today, this is one of the reasons I don't believe there's a bubble, our prices today are still about 5% lower than they would have been if we hadn't gone through the boom and bust cycle. So if you just average things out and say we're going to go up 35 to 4% a year every year like we've done historically, our prices today would be about 5% higher than they, than they are on a national basis. Uh, local results may vary. Um, we're going to look this year at probably 5.5% year over year price increases compared to last year. That's still a little high. Like I said, on a normal year, you're looking at 35 to 4%. Uh, your market is off the charts in terms of, of price increases. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But, but overall, this is getting closer to normal. And normal is really what we're looking for uh, in the housing market. Tough for me, I used to go out and talk to the press a lot, and the press loves bad. If, if, you have, if you have bad news, you're on TV all the time. Look at Donald Trump. So, um, so for, for me, this is a terrible period because this is boring. This is boring real estate. It's, it's up and to the right, slow and steady as she goes, and they kind of go, this is the same story we've had for the last two years. Yeah, get used to it, same story we're going to have for the next two years. But the point I want to make on this chart is the problem we're running into is an affordability problem. That's the next. There are two problems I will warn you about that are coming down the road. One is affordability. And the reason affordability is a, a hidden problem is because the national lumber, numbers look misleadingly good. So if you look at the median salary and the median home price, affordability numbers look really, really good. None of us make the median salary. There's probably one guy in St. Louis who makes the median salary. And by definition, there's an equal number above and below, and he's right, and it's not average, it's median. And very few of us buy the median house. So, so this is where real estate really does become a local game. Um, and and the, the problem with affordability is that for the last seven years, while the housing market has been recovering, I'm not picking that number arbitrarily, it's when the market turned and started to come back. For the last seven years, home price appreciation has outpaced wage growth every year. In fact, the middle class today is making less adjusted for inflation than it made seven years ago. And that's the bulk of your home buying community. It's one of the reasons we're seeing more renters, because they can't afford uh, to, to buy a property. Um, so what we're seeing this year is there was just good news in the jobs report, which is that year over year wages grew by 2.6%. Now, that sounds good, and it is good. It's better than not growing. I want you to just mentally calculate what you earn, figure out what 2.6% of that would be, and ask you if that's enough of an increase for you to run out and make a huge financial commitment. Probably not. But during that same period when you're having a 2.6% increase, which is good, again, it's good, it's progress, houses went up by 5.6%. Okay, so more than twice the pace. You can't keep doing that and expect people to be able to afford to buy the house. And lending, again, is tighter. So you might need a bigger down payment. You might need more pristine credit history. You can't afford to make a mistake. You have to have a long job, job track record. So, so th that's the thing I'd like you to keep in mind is even as home prices start to settle in a little bit, uh, watch for the consumer's ability to keep pace with what's going on. The good news about home prices going up, as we mentioned before, is the negative equity goes down. So fewer people are underwater. That number will continue to improve. It, it's kind of scary that we're looking at this now and saying, oh, gee, it's only about 5% of people that are underwater on their homes. Historically, that number is zero. Because typically, people had to put 20% down on a property, or at least 10% down on a property, and the home prices went up. So if there was a little dip, that was no big deal. But when you had people actually getting loans for 125% of the value of their house, they were underwater to begin with. And when home prices went down from there, it got really ugly. So it, the nature of the lending, the 0% loans, the 2% the two, two loans, the <laughs> negative equity loans, the, all, all the negative amortization loans, all of that stuff is what's contributed to this problem, which still hasn't gone away, and it, it, and it won't probably for the next couple of years until, until things finally settle out. And then California, for example, most of the state out of the situation. There are places outside of Oakland or in Northern California, small towns like Redding, uh, where the majority of people who borrowed during this time period are still underwater in their loans by a lot because those home prices haven't gone up. 
So again, it's important to know your local market, even though I'm giving you these kind of national numbers. We, I talked about affordability becoming a concern. Uh, I don't probably need to beat that anymore. Uh, and, and this is kind of interesting too. I, I, I don't know why they did this red state, blue state, because it has nothing to do with Republicans and Democrats. Um, but the red states are where home prices are still below their, their peak from 2008. And the blue is where they've surpassed. And as I mentioned, you know, Texas firmly in the blue there, Pacific Northwest firmly in the blue. Um, so, so, you know, and, and a lot of these states in the, in the middle of the country never had the huge price appreciation or price depreciation in the first place. So it was mostly around big population centers. But the good news uh, is, is that there's still some headroom. There's still a place for, for, for growth uh, across the country. While this is going on, home ownership rates have declined. Now, I, I wrote a blog post today because I got, I got tired of hearing about how we're becoming a render nation. Okay, we're not a render nation, okay? So uh, home ownership rates dipped to 62.6%. They had peaked around 70% back here, okay? We found out 70% is too high. That was bad. There were a lot of people that should have been renters. We shoved into homes and now they're renters again. And they're renters with really traumatically damaged financial histories. It can take a lot of them a long time to come back. But at 62.6% home ownership, which is the lowest it's been in 40 years, we're still a country with one of the highest rates of home ownership in the world. Much higher than most, state, most countries in Europe. Okay, so we're still one of the highest. And I'm not great at advanced calculus, but I'm pretty good at simple math. So 62.6% of 100 is a lot higher than 37.4% of 100. That's how many people are renting, 37 versus 63. Okay, so my math tells me we're still not a render nation by definition, but it's a fun headline for the media. Um, this number probably still has a little room to go down. Okay, so I've, I've been on the, the, the bear side of the bull and bear conversation here for a couple of years. Uh, I believe this number will probably continue to go down. It may actually dip below 62% before it bottoms out and starts to come back. A lot of reasons for this. I believe they're cyclical, not structural. And what I mean by that, uh, just as recently as today, Fannie Mae issued another report on people's uh, wanting, uh, wanting to buy homes. So what, what's the home buyer sentiment look like? Highest number in the history of the survey today. Um, what's causing this is a lot of people lost homes to foreclosure. Uh, Generation X, not the Millennials, we'll talk about them in a minute. Generation X had the highest home ownership rate of any age group at the peak of the housing boom. They got in at precisely the worst possible time and got slaughtered during the downturn and today have the lowest home ownership rate of any major, of any measured age cohort. Uh, what does that mean for, for them coming back? Well, a lot of them aren't. A lot of them can't financially. They were devastated by what happened during the downturn. A lot of them decided if they could, they'd rather rent a house and raise their family. They like home ownership, but they really don't want to take the risk of that happening again, or they, they're not financially able to, to come back into the market as buyers. So for those of you looking to, to buy properties and rent them out, that, that age group is a really interesting one for you to be looking at. It's not the millennials, it's not the boomers, it's that, that group in between. The millennials, I, they get blamed for everything, and I think they should because they're younger and better looking than me. Um, but the fact of the matter is the millennials are starting to come into the market in meaningful numbers as home buyers. They actually started buying earlier, but they were buying investment properties. So they weren't buying a house to live in, they were renting, but they were buying a house to rent out, interestingly enough. What we are seeing though is in terms of home ownership, keep in mind the, the, er, the vanguard of the millennials, the, early, the, early, the older millennials, came into the market during the Great Recession. So they got out of college and got crappy jobs at really not very good salaries. So they're delaying everything. They're staying in school longer. They're getting their first real job later. They're getting married later. They're having kids later. All of those inflection points that would normally lead somebody to consider a home purchase are taking place later. Uh, in fact, the, the economists will tell you that we've seen the average age of a first-time home buyer go from 30 to 31 years of age 
uh, in a little less than a year. And statistically speaking, that's actually a big deal. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it actually is. So, so the millennials will get there, they're just taking longer to get there than, than in the past. Now, you layer on top of that, uh, the issues with, with loans being difficult and it starts to get really kind of, kind of funky. What's a little weird about this is the expectation had been that home ownership rates would go down a little bit, partly because more households were being formed and more of those were, were becoming renters. But what's happened instead is the number of households being formed and that's any kind of household, a rental household or, or home, home that's owned by the occupants, uh, has slowed down significantly over the last couple of quarters. I believe that has a lot to do with, with student loan debt. Uh, we're having a lot of students coming out of college with a lot more debt than ever before. Uh, the federal government basically gave universities and colleges carte blanche to charge whatever they want because the government's going to guarantee the student loans that are being used to pay for these things. So that $40,000 a year philosophy degree you're going for, good luck with that. Um, $1.35 trillion in student loan obligations, up 6.2% from a year ago. Um, and over a third, uh, or about a third of, of 18 to 34 year olds are now living with their parents. Highest percentage in history. So those are the people who would normally be moving into their first house and mom's having trouble getting them moving out of the basement where they're enjoying themselves playing Xbox. The hope for the future, I believe, is Pokemon Go. <laughs> because we've gotten the millennials out of the basement, out of the house, they can actually see a for sale sign. Maybe it'll trigger something. I think realtors should buy Pokemon and have them in houses they have for sale so the millennials accidentally show up and buy something. I think this is, this is a... Anyway, um, it, it, it will get better, but this is, this is one of the root causes. So Generation X may not come back to the market in the numbers, millennials taking their time. Uh, it, it's, it's a, I, I do believe it's a cyclical thing. I think we will work our way out of this as, as time goes by. By the way, that slowed down the boomers selling their houses too. So when you're talking about inventory, the fact that Junior's still living at home means mom and dad aren't selling the house because they need the extra bedroom. So mom and dad would be selling the house, putting more inventory on the market for the next family to move up so that the first timers could move into their houses. Uh, so this, this, th these, these things all actually play together. Good news, I do have some good news. Delinquencies continue to go down. We saw a slight blip in June, but that's not a big deal. It was, it was early stage delinquencies and, and, and that's not really anything to worry about. But I know this is an eye test, trust me. What it says is all sorts of delinquencies are going down. They are going down now to pre-crisis levels. They're almost back to normal. So if in a normal year, I, I told you before that 4% of loans go delinquent, the number now is about 7%, which is half of what it was at the peak and still just about twice of what it should be, but it's, it's getting better progressively. My friends at Realty Track tell me that foreclosure starts, so you're delinquent for a while, then you get your first foreclosure notice, that's a foreclosure start, uh, are the lowest they've been since back in 2005, which is before everything got completely crazy. So we are working our way back to normal, we're working our way back pretty quickly. And so whether you're looking at you know, the, the, the year over year percentage increase, which is negative, or, or the number of foreclosure starts themselves on a year over year basis going down, this is all good. In fact, 80% of the loans in foreclosure are on loans that were issued before 2010. So 80% of the loans that are in foreclosure are on loans that are at least six years old. Uh, virtually nothing that's been issued over the last couple of years is going delinquent or into foreclosure. That's how tight the lending has been. In fact, I mentioned historically about 1% of loans go into foreclosure. On the last few years, vintages of loans, that's been about a half a percent. So they're performing twice as well. So twice as hard to get, they're performing twice as well. You know, math isn't all that complicated sometimes. So overall foreclosure activity, when you're looking at foreclosure starts, notices of sale and, and repossessions are, are rapidly getting back to normal. I believe, and you can impress your friends at a cocktail party with this, I, I believe that we're going to hit an inflection point in about a year and a half where we're actually gonna go below normal levels of foreclosure activity because the lenders are showing absolutely no signs of loosening up credit to even get back to normal levels and we're going to process through these old loans fairly quickly over the next year. 
So by 2018, we could actually be looking at historically lower than normal levels of foreclosure activity. That does not bode well for people in a room like this that are looking to buy bargain properties. But there will still be bargain properties out there. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, I appreciate the question. So the question was even with the introductions of the 3% down loans. Uh, so when you look at the studies that have been done on the 3% loans, if the underwriting is good on the other aspects of the loan, those loans perform no worse than loans with 5 or 7 or 9% down, at least statistically speaking. Uh, the second thing is that uh, Fannie and Freddie uh, have both reported that they're not getting exactly a, a windfall of business from the 3% offers, partly because the lenders are doing what they call overlays. So if they're going to issue the 3% loan and then sell it to Freddie and Fannie, they're going to make sure it's squeaky clean. So they'll have that borrower jump through hoops. Where you might see a little bit of, of an increase might be in FHA loans. Uh, they're, they're talking about lowering their insurance premiums again because they're actually making money now. Um, and, and they've become kind of the new subprime, although it, it, FHA loans, historically speaking, have been, have been have performed actually pretty well. Not as well as the, the other ones, but, but pretty well. The average down payment is still somewhere in the neighborhood of 10% today, roughly, between, between 5 and 10%, depending on, on your credit. And, and there are lenders who will loan lower FICO score borrowers, but they ask for a much higher down payment, and there are some that will do very low down payments, but require everything else to be absolutely perfect. So it's, it, there, there are trade-offs. But, but this is the way the market's supposed to work. Now, I was talking about home prices maybe starting to slow down as we get more inventory. When home prices slow down a little bit, um, that puts downward pressure on, on, on the local market. Uh, it's not a sign of a bubble. It's, it means we've gotten too expensive and people stopped buying, so the seller had to lower prices. This is how the market's supposed to work. So when you read these stories, keep that in mind. We're actually getting back to what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, foreclosure sales are now somewhere between 6 and 10% of all home sales. At the peak of the market, that was about 40%, which is mind-boggling. Um, and we're still seeing a fairly high number of all-cash sales, somewhere between 20 and 30%, depending on which month we're talking about. I, you and I both know that those are all investor purchases. Uh, for some reason, the reports that come out kind of make that fuzzy, but, but investors are still accounting for 20 to 30 percent of purchases. They're paying cash. Um, that 6 percent number will continue to go down, partly because we'll see more non-distressed inventory come to market, partly because there's less distressed inventory to go around. But that number will continue to go down. What, what I will tell you is that, that even if we dip below normal levels of foreclosure activity. I don't want you to give this up and start putting your money into Chinese bonds. Okay, don't do that, that that's bad. Um, or, or, or especially UK bonds, don't do that at all right now. Um, we might get down to a half a percent for a year. Uh, a half a percent still means there's gonna be a couple hundred thousand properties hitting, hitting the market that are, that are distressed inventory of some type. And the next time we have a little bit of an economic downturn, we will start to see things go up. Now our, our economics team says the next time they see a recession in the future is probably 2019. And now by the way, ask, ask 10 economists when the next recession will be and you get 32 answers. And, and most of them won't have a date. Um, but but it, let's assume we had a downturn in 2019. Um, in, in 2020, we'd start to see some of these properties entering foreclosure. 2021, a lot of them be hitting the market. So, so that's kind of the, 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 the framework now with the new government regulations in place. It takes longer for a lender to put somebody into foreclosure, and it takes the process longer. So you can start kind of getting your clock ticking the next time you, you read that the GDP is in negative numbers and we're in a recession, you know, start the clock ticking and figure 12 to 18 months, you should start seeing the inventory coming around. And by the way, that can be localized. Now you're, you're not going to see a lot of activity here because you're booming. Jobs are increasing, wages are increasing, population's coming in. None of those suggest you're going to have a lot of foreclosure activity anytime soon. So you may have to start broadening your, your geography a little bit if you're looking for those kind of properties. We can help you with that, by the way. Um, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do this. So you, you also have competition coming in the way of international investors. For the last two years, international investors have spent over $100 billion on U.S. residential properties. 
uh, 102 this year, 105 the year before. This year they actually bought more, more properties than they did the previous year. China has passed Canada as the, uh, the number one purchaser. Um, they, they account for three times as many homes sold as Canadian buyers and they account for as many purchases as uh, the next three combined. So if you're a flipper or if you're a rent and hold person looking for investors, you may want to try and look for some of those uh, LLCs that are funded by Chinese investors uh, to, to, be, to be kind of part of your investment group, if you will, or, or to flip the properties to them. Uh, and Texas, by the way, is one of the four states uh, that gets most of the activity. California, probably not surprising. Uh, Florida, um, not New York. Uh, California, Florida, Arizona, and Texas are the four big ones. Uh, and honestly, I forget what, the, I think it's New Jersey, uh, actually, that's, that's the, the, the other one up there. But there, there is buying activity, you know, really across the board uh, from, from multiple countries. Uh, Venezuela, those numbers will probably continue to go down because their, their economy is in a bit of shambles right now. Uh, but, but Canada, China, India, Mexico, the UK, Germany, uh, France, a lot of buyers. And every time there's economic volatility internationally, you see a flood of money coming into the US market. Uh, and, and they bought similar numbers of commercial properties, not the same number of properties but in terms of dollar volume. Uh, biggest sale we've ever made. Uh, to show you how this is working now, it was a $96 million office complex that we sold entirely online last year. And the purchaser, uh, property was in Los Angeles, purchaser was, for, was a Canadian investment fund. And the Canadian investment fund got its money from Chinese investors. And, and that's how the world is working right now. We got a call from a guy who wanted, uh, wanted a 24 hour extension on closing on a home he bought on, on the website. He was calling us from his son's soccer match in India. So this is where the world is going in terms of real estate and U.S. real estate is viewed as a safe harbor uh, for investors who aren't liking the options they see in, in other parts of the world. Uh, how'd you like to be an investor banking on U.K. businesses or, or you know, treasury no the equivalent of treasury notes uh, in England right now not knowing what's going to happen with Brexit? So again, every time you see one of those one of those volatile situations occurring overseas, uh, opportunity for, for U.S. real estate sales. I, I, only a couple slides here. I'm not going to come in here and pretend to know your market better than you because I do not. Uh, we, we do track a lot of markets. You're one of the, the, the markets that we follow on a somewhat regular basis. By the way, I think you were probably in the top 10 in terms of, of hottest housing markets, but if not, you were really close. Um, so. Um, Home sales are rising at about half the U.S. pace. That's a little misleading because that's on a percentage basis. So your, your home sales are actually still rising uh, pretty significantly. The number I thought was, was fascinating was that uh, the prices are running something like 12 times the, the U.S. average in terms of year-over-year -year, uh, numbers. So it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a ridiculous number. I actually have reports on the single-family market in Dallas, I can email you as well. It goes through some of the some of the parameters: home building, housing starts, home ownership rates. Uh, and one of the opportunities for you as an investor in the region, by the way, uh, is, is, is if you're a flipper. And and we find that a lot of the people we survey that are buying from us in the region are flippers. Is that your home ownership rates are actually lower than national average? So Dallas home ownership rates are just a, a, a pinch below 60 percent. And I mentioned that the U.S. rates close to 63 percent. So there's probably still some headroom in terms of, of people looking for properties. Um, and, and along those lines, at least according to the formula my economist came up with, uh, it, it's more affordable to buy than it is to rent in the, in the metro. Um, so so that, that, again, kind of bodes to flipping. What we see is in markets with, with rapidly rising home prices, strong sales, strong job growth, and high rental costs, uh, most of the investors we work with tend to be flippers. Uh, and that, that's especially true when there's low inventory of, of properties available. Uh, so the opportunity to, to get a house for a little bit below market value, throw some paint and carpeting in, uh, and, and sell it at a, at a premium price is, is still pretty good. I know I made that sound really easy, didn't I? Um, and it's just that easy. Just talk to Tim and Chris and they'll tell you. Um, Home ownership is growing, but slowly the, the vacancy rate has dipped quite a bit. So uh, your, your vacancy rate now in terms of, uh, of rental properties is down to about 5.2% by the last numbers that we saw. 
Uh, that's, that's right around where it should be historically. It was a little bit higher than that. And that a lower vacancy rate bodes well for two things. It bodes well for uh, the opportunity to rent properties because there's not much vacant and it also bodes well in terms of rental prices uh, being, being stable and maybe rising. And that is in the single family? That's single family and multifamily. We'll get to multifamily in a second, yep. Uh, and available inventory, available inventory is down. <laughs> That's the number I saw. So your home prices uh, are, are going up fast, but available inventory is down 20% from a year ago. Uh, big, big drop. And again, the report I have shows housing starts and, and they're, the numbers get mind-boggling. I, I think, I think your, your, it's either your permits or your housing starts are up 232% from the, the bottom of the market. But they're still 140% below where you were at the peak. So that, that just shows you how crazy the numbers went for, for a little while. Uh, vacancy rates, this is, this is multifamily rate, um, so it, it is a blended rate. 5.2% in the first quarter of this year. Uh, that's up 20 basis points from the previous quarter and 30 basis points from a year ago, but you're still dealing with about average levels of vacancy uh, on a historic basis. So the good news, if you're an investor or if you're a landlord, is that you're not dealing with, with higher than normal vacancy rates anymore. Uh, the other thing we noticed is when, you, when we've looked at permits, and started to forecast available units, what's coming to market, the, the numbers start to dip pretty significantly a couple of years from now. So there isn't a lot scheduled. Now this can change because all somebody has to do is get a permit and break ground, and they can start building more units. But based on what's in the pipeline right now, uh, you can see that when you're talking about completions, uh, you know, 2018, you're down to about 6,900 compared to about 12,500 this year. So it's a pretty big drop in, in, in units coming to market. Uh, and, and the vacancy rates more or less hold steady. Now 2019, uh, we're looking at about 6.5%, which is the highest. Um, you see where rent, rents are on average and what the rent percent, percentage changes. But, but as far out as 2018, you're still looking at almost 4% average rental rate increases on a year-over-year -year basis. So opportunities for you to buy and rent as well. And, and again, one of the things you want to watch for is multifamily vacancies. If they dip, that provides more opportunities for single family homes to be rented. Uh, and, and multifamily doesn't necessarily mean big apartment complex, it could be a duplex, it could be a triplex. Okay, so it could be, could be something else. How are, anybody's been keeping track of time? How are we doing on time here, Chris? A little after nine. When do we start? The left or eight? Okay. Let me go through this pretty quickly. I'm not going to give you a big sales pitch. Auction.com. I, I mentioned it, it's our, our website. So if you're looking for properties at any point in time, there's about 23,000 properties on auction.com that you can't find anywhere else because they're not on the MLS. These are homes that lenders, whether they're banks, government entities, or in investment funds, have given us to dispose of on their behalf. We sell two kinds of properties on auction.com. About 23,000, give or take. Uh, they're not all here in Dallas, obviously, or we'd be reading about it in the paper. Um, but this is, this is kind of what it looks like when you get to auction.com. Um, we have property details pages on all the properties, uh, and, and what we'll do is give you as much information as we have uh, in, in the property details area. We're about to improve that. We've licensed some more public record data. You'd be surprised how little information you sometimes get from a bank who owns a property. Uh, unless you've ever tried to buy a property from a bank, then you won't be surprised at all. Um, but we will put down you know, property characteristics, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage, year built, all that good stuff. Whatever we can find, we'll put in there. We'll tell you what the property sold for the last time. We'll tell you what the opening bid is on a property uh, that's being auctioned. Uh, and I, I do want to tell you how this works. The opening bid is not the sales price, ever, ever, ever. Every property on our site has a reserve price that's been set by the seller. So if they want to sell it for $100,000, the opening bid's not going to be $100,000. It'll be a, a fraction of that. It might be $30,000, it might be $40,000. And we do that to stimulate people coming in and bidding. And we do that for another reason. Any of my clients here? <clears throat> okay. So our job is to get the most money we can for our sellers. I'm not gonna apologize for that. that that's our job, get the most money we can. The truth of the matter is a lot of these properties sell for below the reserve price. So if we start you out at a reserve price, like it's a list price on the MLS, there's an opportunity for you to actually miss out on being able to buy the property for less. So the, the, the bidding actually works both ways. And our job is to find a number that you can live with and that the seller can live with. And if it's over the reserve, great. And if it's under the reserve, as long as everybody's happy, equally great. We don't care. 
We just want to sell the property, honestly. Um, so information, what, what, we sell two kinds of properties. We sell properties at the courthouses. If you've gone to, if you've gone to Super Tuesday here in Dallas, you see a lot of people in green polo shirts, that's us. Uh, most of your peers in the investment community hate us because we took what used to be a very closed process where there'd be four guys in a corner, and they were guys, in a corner with clipboards, divvying up who got to buy which property for how much. It sounds illegal and like collusion, but it wasn't because they didn't get caught. Um, <laughs> and, and so we opened them up to the public. We have a professional auctioneer doing the auctions. So not surprisingly, you have more people bidding in an open environment. Typically, you wind up paying a little bit more. Now, we try to offset that by sometimes offering coffee and donuts. Uh, but, but basically, it's an opportunity for those of you who weren't insiders to actually participate in these auctions. We market all of these properties on our website in advance. The only place you can buy them is at the courthouse steps. That's a state law. That has nothing to do with us not wanting to sell them online. But you can do your diligence. You can do your research up front. Uh, all online without having to, to go to the courthouse and, and dig around on your own. We're also in, in, in introducing a new application. How many of you have tried to bid at a courthouse auction? Okay. So if you've been to a courthouse auction, you know that about 30% of the time the auctions get canceled or postponed. So we're creating a new application since we're in contact with the lenders to try and provide early notification to whoever's signed up for these auctions about any changes in status on the property so that you can not waste your time going for that one property that you really wanted. Yes, ma'am. So you are saying that you can do all your research, mm -hmm. but the buyers have to show up at your live venue. You yes, you must show up at the venue unless you have somebody bidding on your behalf at the venue. People, some people do that. They have a pro it's called a proxy bidder. Uh, typically, you need to pay cash for these, either cash or a cashier's check. Uh, typically, they're very state by state, but in, very often you have to pay that day, that time. Uh, you are at an auction, you are buying a property as is, where is, so there's no warranties implied or guaranteed. So this is a venue where you can actually get your best buys, but it comes with the highest amount of risk, and you probably have to do the highest amount of homework in order to be ready for these things. So. We have people who do this for a living, that's all they do. Uh, and, and, it, it, and, and they do it very well and they, they make, make money doing it. Yes, ma'am. Great question. Can you see the properties beforehand? You can drive by the properties, but the majority of them are occupied by the borrower who's being foreclosed on, and you're not allowed to trespass or disturb the borrower. And we'll typically have something on the property page itself that says, do not disturb the borrower, it's trespassing. So you can't do that, you're gonna have to do a drive-by. And that's where the expertise comes in too, in that you know a seasoned investor can kind of drive by a property, take a look at the outside, and get a pretty good idea what the inside looks like as well, uh, in terms of, of what kind of shape the property's in. But if you buy a property you know, with, with somebody in it, you're gonna have to evict that person. Uh, or turn them into a tenant if you want to do that. We have some buyers that do that. Um, but, but you're taking on the responsibility that formerly the lender had. So not probably the ideal opportunity for a first time investor who's never done this before. Uh, you might want to work with some other people who've done it. I understand that earlier there were a number of realtors here. There are realtors who specialize in this and would be willing to work with you to kind of help you through the process as well. I, I'd really encourage if you're just getting started on this, go to a few of the auctions just to kind of get a feel for what they work like. You know, prepare yourself to what, what would I bid for property X and see what property X actually sells for to see how close you are. Uh, ask a lot of questions. People are actually very willing to talk about this stuff at the events. Um, and then probably hook up with a, a real estate professional, whether it's a realtor or a real estate attorney, uh, who can answer questions and, and help keep you out of trouble. The other kind of properties we sell are bank-owned properties. These tend to be a little safer buys, but I will warn you that this is changing too. So there are two types of bank-owned properties. There's your traditional REO. And when I started in the market, I had to be convinced that an REO is not something you dipped in milk after dinner. I'll give you a, se I'll give you a second on that, okay. Um, and funny story, REO stands for real estate owned. And when the banks first put this together, they actually spelled it O-R-E-O. It was other real estate owned. Uh, I don't know why they dropped the O, probably a trademark issue. But um, so REOs, bank owned properties, there are two types. There's a traditional one where the bank forecloses on the property, nobody buys it at the auction, so they repossess it. So now they own the property. They evict the tenant or the, the borrower. They'll 
pay somebody to clean out the mess in the house. They'll probably pay somebody to do some minor repairs if it only needs minor repairs. They'll hire a realtor. Uh, they'll remarket the property, put it back on the market, and 12 to 18 months after the foreclosure, they'll sell the property. Okay? Now, at that point, usually they've cleared up title. The house is more or less moving ready, uh, and, and it's a fairly safe buy. You're also not going to save as much money on that purchase as you would have at the, at the courthouse, for obvious reasons, because the bank's been carrying this thing on their books for the last year. There's a, a new in-between kind of REO that's coming to market more and more rapidly. These tend to be government homes. Uh, it's a program called CWCOT. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but basically it's a property that the, the lender, the government entity, is going to sell without taking the title back. So they go through the foreclosure, nobody buys the property, they repossess it, but they don't go through the whole drill. They basically hand it to a company like ours and say, go sell this tomorrow or the next day, or as soon as you can. And they'll discount the property, but it comes with whatever warts happen to be on the property. If there's a borrower still living there, you have to evict the borrower. If the, if the title's not clean, you have to clean up the title. If there's structural damage with the house, that becomes your problem. So it's kind of this in-between thing. It's not that you, and you can, by the way, you can get a hard money loan for some of these, okay? So it's, it's not like what you would be doing at the courthouse steps. It's an online process, just like eBay for real estate, okay? And that's what our website's really like. Um, it comes at a good price, probably a better price than the one you'd have to wait a year to come to market for, but it's gonna require more work and, and provides a little bit more risk for you to buy these. So it's really as is, including all of the... As, and, and as and is, where is, who is. Yes, it, it's all there. Um, and and, and so, um, so those are the two types of, of REOs. Now, if you're buying something on the website, we do all the documentation online. Uh, you have to arrange your financing on your own, but basically we have a partnership with a company called DocuSign. We work in their, I think it's called Transaction Room. Uh, so you'll get your paperwork entirely online. So no more running around and, 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 and getting your hand stamped. If this is the contract the closing is, is done online. Yes, ma'am? CWCOT. And CWCOT stands for Conveyance of Title, and I think, it, I forget what the first C stands for, but um, something without Conveyance of Title. Yes? Conveyance without Claim of Title. Thank you. I always get those confused. Too many acronyms in our business. Uh, for those of you with questions, even if you're not buying something from us, we have something we now call the auction.com community. Free part, the, the website, by the way, is free. Uh, this is a free part of the free website where you can go talk to other people in, in the business. If you have questions about how the process works, we'll answer them. If you just have questions about investing, some of your peers are up here on a fairly regular basis. So, so feel free to check that out. Um, one, of our, one of our mantras at the company is we think people should be able to buy real estate wherever they are, whenever they want, on whatever device they happen to use. Uh, I, I told you about the, the guy who called from India. Uh, my favorite story is somebody, we, we launched our iPad native app, which is a, I actually like better than the website. Um, we got a call from a guy all excited because he made his first purchase. It was a two and a half million dollar hotel in Phoenix. He wanted to call us and tell us how excited he was because he was able to buy it on his iPad while he was driving. <laughs> so don't, don't do that, but it's kind of fun. Uh, and we, we have apps now for, for, for both iOS and for Android. Again, not, probably not a big surprise since Google's an investor, right? Um, but, but there's, you can now register for an auction, you can sign up for an account, you can bid, you can get notices that you're not the high bidder anymore, all from your phone. You can be waiting in line at Starbucks and you'll get a message while you're trying to catch the Pokemon uh, telling you that, that you're not the high bidder anymore from auction.com. So it's, it's, it's all interrelated. Um, and, and whatever device you're on, we, we've optimized the website. So it was designed with some, something called responsive design. So the website will kind of figure out what device you're using and configure itself to, to be as optimal as possible for that, uh, that particular piece. And if you just want to kind of scan the market for a while and figure out what's going on, uh, Feel free to sign up for a free email uh, we, and just tell us what kind of properties you're looking for and where. And when anything hits our database, we send out messages to you via email uh, letting you know that there are new properties coming into the system. Who has a question? 
I see your hand up. You must have a question. It's a really good question. Why would a bank give a give a four million dollar mortgage to somebody making forty thousand dollars a year? Um, no, it, it's a fair question, and and one of the one of the reasons they were interested in this program uh, is is kind of made the case to them that if they move more quickly, not only would it benefit them because of their carrying costs for twelve to eighteen months, but would actually also be better for the neighborhood. So if you think about it, you bring an investor in, the investor's not motivated to let the money sit there for 18 months. You want to, you want to turn the building. You either want to fix it and sell it to somebody, and if you do that, you're going to improve the quality of the building and sell it at a, at a reasonable price, uh, or you want to rent it to somebody, and in which case it's not in foreclosure anymore. One of the things that really hurts the value of surrounding properties is that people find out there's a home in foreclosure. Um, so what happened, when, when we went back and, and reviewed the first, you know, year or so of this program is we found out that it was making a difference of millions and millions of dollars to the banks. Partly, they have statutory issues they have to deal with that do slow the process down a little bit. Partly, you know, frankly, they're not in the real estate business. You know, they're, they're kind of in the banking business. Um, and there are companies that, that service the banks that might not be motivated to work as quickly as, as others just because maybe they get paid over a period of time. So there's all sorts of weird market things that, that make that situation a little less logical than it should be. So uh, lots of buying opportunities on auction.com. Um, I, I know I ran a little bit over my time. I apologize for that. I'd still be happy to answer any questions if I haven't exhausted everybody. And if you have any questions for me, there's my contact information. Um, and feel free to follow me on Twitter. That's what that little